And we now need to have this discussion, including, including with the pension fund industry in our country, in the insurance fund industry, and have a broad and wholesome discussion. And I would encourage all those who've got views to come forward with their views. We are faced with a situation where our financial resources have been depleted. And we are facing a situation where our developmental needs are enormous. And in a number of other places, pension funds, funding is utilized for developmental purposes, for infrastructure, and quite often, those, those uh, pension funds make good returns out of infrastructure developments. So I am saying now that let's have that discussion. Let it be a national discussion. And that's exactly what we plan to do, Mr. President. That was Cyril Ramaphosa skirting the question of whether or not he supports prescribed asset policy in South Africa. I'm Garabale Tata, and you're watching Political Capital. Prescribed asset policy is understood to refer to government essentially forcing savings and pension industry to buy government stock as well as bonds. The Association for Savings and Investment South Africa, ASISA, which through its member savings represents some 6.2 trillion rand of the nation's savings and investments, say that the policy did not work under apartheid and that it would have negative impact on the economy of the country if introduced now. But can they stop it? Janina Slavsky, Principal Investment Consultant at Alexander Forbes Investment, joins me for that discussion on whether or not it's a policy that should be pursued. And on the other side of the story, ANC's, or at least one of ANC's biggest benefactor is no more. Or is he? There are still more questions than answers following the horrific crash that led to the passing of Bosasa CEO Gavin Watson. We will show you a discussion we had recently with the author of the book, the Bosasa Billions, how the African National Congress sold its soul for bribe hacks, booze, and bags of cash. But first, South Africa is broke and has a mountain of responsibility that needs money. So, which will come first? A rating of your savings and mine, or a trip to the IMF? Or can we avoid both? Janina Slavsky, Principal Investment Consultant at Alexander Forbes, joins me now for that. Janina, thank you very much for your time. Prescribed asset policy is not new in South Africa. You point out in your piece that it was around in 1956 introduced by the apartheid government. Why was it stopped? Because it wasn't working. Essentially, any time you do prescription, you're forcing assets into investments where they don't want to go. Essentially, investments can be lazy because they've got uh, ready capital coming in. So since you earn poorer returns, I mean, bonds earned less than inflation and vastly less than equities during the time that prescription was in What place. are your members most afraid of? Just putting some of their hard-earned savings and pension into SOEs? Or can investments be patriotic? And in this case, we would be going against the investment norms. <laughs> Look, everyone agrees that we need to sort out the budget deficits uh -huh. and find solutions, SOE debt and so on. But the solution isn't to make defined contribution members poorer, because mm -hmm. that's exactly what this would do. If you can find ways to get goods assets that you can put your defined contribution members into, they're going to get better returns, but Yanina, I'm which is a argue solution. for the president here and the politicians. It's, it's very bleak reading when data points above the country keep coming out. It doesn't actually feel like a new dawn is here. It feels like it's somewhere in the distance, but not quite here yet. Why shouldn't we use this dormant capital? I mean, Asisa, you know, through, the mem through his members, represents some 6.2 trillion. Surely, wipe ESCOM off the dead burden, no? Essentially, it's not a piggy bank sitting there ready <laughs> to be raided. I mean, one of the keys is actually don't do prescription because, first of all, you're going to scare away all foreign investors. Forget your hundred billion dollars that uh, Ramaphosa that's why aspires. We, I to thought get. that's why we're eyeing local money to really, I don't know, have a have a different narrative about this investment drive that Sir Ramaphosa has been on even before he became president, which doesn't seem like capital is coming to the party about. 
but your local capital, if it's forced investment, mm -hmm. essentially your bonds will become less and less attractive and your foreigners will leave. Plus, no foreigner wants to put assets into an economy that is being restricted in mm -hmm. terms of prescription. But it doesn't seem like foreigners want to put capital into this economy right now. And that's part of the problem. But let's turn the conversation. Because okay. what we all want mm -hmm. is investment into um, job creating economic growth. Mm -hmm. You create those opportunities. And believe me, foreign investors will flood in as will local investors. It's not a lack of capital, uh -huh. it's a lack of opportunities. And everything, the NDP, the job summits, the investment summit, all of those were focused on, let's find positive investment scenarios, and then pension fund money will flow. Members will get better benefits, mm -hmm. infrastructure will be um, built, me uh, people will have jobs, win, 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 yeah, no, and creating opportunity for the government to sort good out. Good and well, and I shouldn't be doing this to you because you don't represent the entire pension fund industry, but you are a member of the industry and an important voice in it as well. I mean, the president needs help. He's under attack here. And it doesn't seem like, like business, as much as he was vocal about the lack of governance and the rampant corruption of Jacob Zuma years, that now that we have apparently turned the corner, Business doesn't seem to be coming to the table. Surely business can do more, right? I mean, business is desperate this just to a, do more. But isn't are the politician just as desperate to have means to do more? I think we're all desperate to do more. Mm -hmm. Give us the opportunity. I mean, my colleague speaks about Indonesia, mm -hmm. where the government kind of came out and said, we want investment into the following projects that are going to create jobs. Mm -hmm. And investors went, how soon can we invest? Give that, develop it in South Africa, as I said, the assets will flood. Is that the problem here? That government has not given the market an investable project? Is yes. that the problem? That is the problem. So why did you communicate this? I mean, like, Cyril Ramaphosa is very uh, business savvy. Surely, if we've ever had a president that we can tell about business, is that one. So why isn't the message filtering through? Strong messages are going, but I think it's, it's just the, the glue in the system that's not making things work yet. Mm -hmm. There are so many initiatives mm. that have been started between private, public. Those are the ones that you need to start getting going. Mm -hmm. Those will create the jobs. They'll create the revenue mm -hmm. that starts uh, digging us out of the, the fiscal deficit. Uh, fair enough. Positive, positive, <laughs> positive. Uh, okay. Just don't do the negative, which is prescription, which solves nothing and creates a whole lot of unintended consequences. What do you see government doing in the meantime, when it feels like so many constrictive walls are closing in, literally, we have no room to move. What do we do in the meantime? I think you have to look at all the initiatives that are actually happening and use them as case studies okay. and build on them, build on them, build on them. I mean, we've got investors going to funds that are built around uh, the jobs fund, mm -hmm. where essentially government is giving a guarantee to someone who's starting a company, yeah. and only if it fails does the guarantee come in. They don't fail. These are brilliant companies. They are creating jobs. So just take all these and leverage them up. But we don't have something that creates the critical mass that we need to get employed. And Not maybe yet. that's part of the problem. And when people think about like a situation like ESCOM, even with the separation of the company into three different units, one cannot help but you know accept the sad reality that job cuts are going to have to go. So how do we get more people employed if we are actually just shaving numbers? But let's get the jobs going. Mm -hmm. Let's look at what came out of Job Summit. I mean, essentially you've got, let's go to e-visas. Mm -hmm. We would have so many people, so, so many countries flooding us as tourists. They want to come. They can't at the moment. You only have a couple of centers in China where you can get a physical visa. Mm -hmm. Change that. Uh, do your bandwidth auction. Get your SMEs up and running. Start creating jobs, understanding that then there's other parts of the economy where we're going to have to start cutting. But you can't start cutting when there's absolutely no jobs in the system. Mm -hmm. So we want all focus, private-public par uh, partnership. Mm -hmm. Let's get the jobs growing. Different industries, different uh, growth areas, but get the jobs growing. Let me ask something. The pension industry is obliged to invest in other ways. I mean, through Regulation 28, for instance. So why is this such a bad move? Is it because we're increasing the quantum of that forced investment? Is that the only problem? And it's also willing buyer, willing seller. So right now, <laughs> yes, you have to have a minimum amount in bonds, mm -hmm. but you can see there's been uh, initiatives over the last few years. When investors weren't happy mm. with a company's balance sheet, let's mm -hmm. call it a municipality, SOE, government or corporates, 
they could say, we want different things. We want more governance. We want a higher uh, yield. We want different governance structures. As soon as you start saying you have to put a minimum amount in mm -hmm. and increasing those minimums, then suddenly that relationship changes and you're getting a poorer return for your members. Government is essentially the largest public funds manager in the country has failed, isn't it? If, if the economy was good, would we be having this much of a resistance to it? Is it because the economy is bad? Yes, it is. Okay. Any concept of prescription, we're essentially having to set up some sort of a mm -hmm. state structure and so on that's going to do the administration or the delivery of the bonds, you have to have trust in that system. Otherwise, you've got a negative. The politicians have more power than you. You guys have more money than them. And you can lobby and lobby, but if the president is right that Kosatu is essentially, in principle, agrees with their own member savings, you know, closing gaps at Transnet, ESCOM, and on and on and on. And if, you know, political parties like the EFF, which seems to support the idea when, during the Q&A in Parliament, if there's enough political momentum, could this be forced on the industry? What do you expect would be the consequence of that? It could happen. It could be forced on the industry. What's the consequence? The reality is a lot of employers will say, well, their members will uh, require them to say, <laughs> we're going to close our pension fund. An employer can do that tomorrow. We've had a few instances recently where an employer just says, I don't want to ever have a fund anymore. He terminates, and I as an individual now say, I have to preserve whatever I've built up so mm -hmm. far, but the rest I'm just going to invest in unit trusts. I'm going to take as much offshore as I can. I'm going to start looking after myself and choosing my investments because I don't want to be forced through my retirement fund mm. through prescribed assets into suboptimal and assets. And it's a narrow way of looking at the situation, but when I hear the president who last week was speaking about yet another investment drive, people are really convinced that his plan is not quite coming together. And that doesn't only um, you know, jeopardize the president's position, but also ours, because it says that essentially we're in, in negative growth, really. South African money is not growing. We need an intervention. Are your members going to come up with a creative way of, how do I put this, um, keeping the dogs at bay at least for a while? Look, as you say, I mean, we've had great ideas. If mm -hmm. you look at pension funds today, they already invest into great developmental opportunities. But, the politicians but on a small do scale, uh -huh. that's the issue. Mm -hmm. We need to find ways working together to scale up. Mm. And as I said, all the conversations have been had. We just now to need to see glue out of the system, actually get some action. My final devil at, devil's advocate's question is, what if the quantum is increased on Regulation 28 rather than having a prescribed... Uh, asset policy. Would, would that be something you work with? Because essentially, the president said we must talk about this. I just don't know what your red line is. As I always say in this conversation, there's the really bad, the not so bad, <laughs> the potentially good and the great. Yeah. We obviously want to focus on the great. But yes, just increasing the limits towards bonds mm -hmm. would be less bad. Because mm -hmm. essentially it says you still have the ability to negotiate with whoever wants your money and actually set your terms. As soon as you say, okay, you must hold so much of this bond mm -hmm. or this SOE bond, you've taken away the ability to negotiate and you're ending up with a poorer result for the investor. Being is the pension fund manager. Is there an SOE that's better than another? Is there an SOE that would be worth an investment? If you look today at pension funds, they've got a range of SOE investments. Mm -hmm. There's definitely SOEs mm -hmm. who have better quality in terms of governance, Obviously, some have government guarantees, which mm -hmm, make them more attractive mm -hmm, than the course. ones that don't. But some are well-run businesses. People actually already want to and invest a lot in them. And they have easy access to the market because they're doing the right things. That's my guest, Janina Slawski, Principal Investment Consultant at Alexander Forbes Investment.